Just before we get started, I do want to say that this episode is brought to you by one of my favorite sponsors, Vessi Shoes, who make shoes that are 100% waterproof. And they say right here, don't say water resistant, they are waterproof. Like, you can put your foot into this and you could dip it into a puddle or the sea or whatever and it is just waterproof. It like comes off like a duck's back. And I don't even mean that like in the metaphorical sense. I mean it like the water goes onto there and it just kind of flies away. You'll see it in the B-roll footage. And obviously these ones are brand new, but these ones that I'm wearing right now, I've been wearing, you can see that they're like worn. I've been wearing these for the best part of three years, two and a half years now, and they are still waterproof, which I don't really understand how. I would basically call it a miracle. They call it something called Dymatex, which is a dual climate and material that keeps you cool in the summer and warm in the colder months. And it's waterproof, but it doesn't feel like it should be waterproof. It doesn't. It's amazing. Uh, they're also sustainably made. They're vegan. They're comfortable, lightweight, breathable. The best thing is you put them on when you first get them. You're like, oh, it's a bit tight, but it's part of the, the process. You put them on and then they like expand a tiny bit to like fit your feet and the... The best thing I can say about them, and I say this every time I do these ad reads, I don't wear other shoes now, unless I have to wear like smart shoes because I'm going somewhere smart or something. Like, I mean, even though I, I don't know, I'll just wear my Vessi's. <laughs> but I just wear them all the time. Look, all you need to do is go to Vessi.com slash criminalist. There's also a link below. Use my code criminalist. You're at $25 off a pair of adult Vessi shoes. I can't recommend them enough. And now today's video. Hi everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, hello there, I'm your host Simon Wammons here, one of my writers in this case, Matt. Thank you, Matt, has written me a script, The Midnight Sun Killer. Terror of Anchorage. Midnight Sun Killer definitely sounds like a movie. So hopefully this will be exciting. The format is, I've got a script in front of me, it's new to me, I've not read it before. Uh, we're gonna explore it together. It's gonna be fun. Let's go. It's probably not gonna be fun. Why do you always say this? <laughs> It's always funny. It's literally got killer in the title. The Terror of Anchorage. In Alaska? Anchorage is in Alaska, right? Yes, let's go. The date is November the 12th, 2016, and the time is 4.30 a.m. in the morning in Anchorage, Alaska. The sunrise is less than an hour away and a call goes out over the police dispatch. Answered by officer Arn Salau. Dispatchers just received a call from a cab driver mere minutes prior about one of their passengers. After arriving at their destination, the passenger simply hopped out of their vehicle and walked off, refusing to play, pay. Salau said he'd check it out and started to make his way there. I've done this once. <laughs> it's a criminal act. This isn't a story, like a drunk story, where it's like, oh my god, I forgot to pay. I was like, um, I was actually in America, I was in New York, and I wanted to go somewhere. And uh, I ordered a taxi, and the taxi's like, absolutely, I can take you here, no problem. And it's like, 10 minutes drive, no worries, let's go. And so I get in, and like 10 minutes go by, 15 minutes go by, and I'm like, wait, are we, we we're like driving around, we've been here before. Like, we're driving around in circles, so either you're taking me for a ride, or we're lost, and you're supposed to be a cab driver. And I was supposed to go to, um, this was a long time ago, uh, is the Colbert Report even on TV anymore? Is that still a thing? But this was back, it was more than 10 years ago, and my aunt uh, knew, like, a writer or a producer on that show or something, and she got me, like, a ticket, like, the last minute, and was like, please show up, because these are really hard to come by, and uh, it's a big favour for my friends. And I'm like, yeah, of course. Of course I'll show up. I'm in New York. Let's go. And uh, yeah, so this cab driver drives me around and I, I totally miss this thing. And then I'm like, mate, what's going on? And he's like, yeah, I don't know where it is. And I'm like, well, drop me off here then. And I go to get out and he's like, that will be like 20 bucks or whatever. And I'm like, are you f***ing kidding me? You Contract not fulfilled, mate. And so I just wander off. <laughs> I'm not sure is that, uh, I mean, allegedly... <laughs> As he drove off, Officer Salau was no doubt on edge. Over the summer months, a killer had been wreaking havoc on the streets of Anchorage and already claimed five lives since July. Not much information was known about the culprit, only that witnesses described him as a white male with long brown hair, over six foot tall, wearing a camouflage jacket, and the weapon had been positively identified as a Colt Python 357 Magnum revolver. It's very specific. As Officer Salau crept closer and closer to where the cabbie reported being ripped off, 
he caught sight of someone a man was walking down the street in the opposite direction to where the call had come from believing this to be the perp salau followed after them for several moments the next two minutes were captured on officer salau's dash cam and was later released on the internet by the anchorage pd for all to see the man kept on walking even as it became obvious that a police cruiser was tailing him eventually Salau put his lights on and pulled up right behind the man i mean to, to be fair that's fair if there's a police car slowly following me as i walk along the pavement i'm not stopping and being like everything all right it's their job to be like is everything all right with you or like buzz the lights and then i'll be like okay look if you buzz the lights or like go whoop whoop i'm gonna turn around and be like what's up and then i'm sure the officers will wave at me and i'll be like what do you want <laughs> but like otherwise you don't it'd be weird to stop and be like why are you following me they're police <laughs> don't be confrontational eventually Salah put his lights on and pulled up right behind the man briefly getting out of his car to get his attention still the suspect kept walking not even turning around Salah, frustrated got back in his car and kept tailing him turning on his megaphone this is the anchorage police you need to stop this is the anchorage police you need to stop as soon as officer salau sent this message loud and clear over the megaphone the man suddenly turned around without missing a beat the man walked up to salau's car just as the officer had put his cruiser in park what this man does next and the quickness with which he does it is very disturbing to say the least as Arn salau looked up from at this imposing figure the man removed something out of his pocket and raised his arm we now observe as we enter the darkness to unearth more of this twisted tale officer Arn salau's eyes widen in recognition and horror as he looks upon the man wearing a black beanie to cover his long brown hair and camouflage jacket staring down the barrel of a colt python 357 magnum revolver as the monster squeezes the trigger bang 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 sorry i couldn't help it long days of light let's rewind and set the stage proper today we travel once more to alaska seemingly the one place besides mexico where criminals believe they'll be safe from the long arm of the law yes yeah, where they always go in the movies like where are you going like i will escape into alaska the great wide north no one will ever find me there they might have a point though with this vast landscapes covered in snow its massive forests and its large mountains and lakes there's plenty of places to hide yet much to admire as well i guess so i can't imagine ever wanting to live in alaska though no offense to anyone who lives in alaska but i don't know i'm, I'm like i don't want it to be too hot i don't want it to be too cold i'm just like can't we just have a nice temperate climate it was like 34 degrees last week and i was like oh jesus christ why why summer is not nice it's too hot spring and autumn are where it's at and then also in the winter it's like i don't like minus 30. no one likes minus 30. it's just no <laughs> ask any eskimo and they'll say frozen keeps the freshness in every day people travel alaska every year to camp hike mountain bike and ski they also have a booming economy with much of their exports coming from crude oils as well as multitude of seafood and mineral laws one of the most interesting facts about america's chilly northern stepchild is the length of the days and nights it's not uncommon during the warmer months to have days where the sun is up almost all day long the final rays of light only leaving the sky a little before midnight it's because of this fact and the time frame in which the majority of these cases took place that our culprit became known as the midnight sun killer oh that makes sense and this is like i love the longer days that's one of the best parts about summer not if you know anything about vampires like how it's like light in the morning when you wake up it's light at night when you go to bed at least it is for me because i've got kids i go to bed at like nine o'clock i love that the problem is if you live in like a country like far north it's like great you know it's like light at 11 o'clock at night but it also means like in the winter it's like lunchtime and it's getting dark in like in in the is it in the arctic circle or in like the north pole or whatever it's dark for like three months <laughs> that is not i'd get i'd go crazy i'd get that um that sads disease seasonal affective disorder syndrome or whatever it is where it's like you know you just get depressed because it's dark all the time i think it's like winter comes and i'm like Ugh, dark or and i expect with bloody kids again it's like they get you know you get up at five and it's all oh, brilliant it's not going to be light for three hours thanks guys love this love this the first bodies at 7 45 a.m on july the 3rd 2016 a bicyclist was riding along a bike path near the river ship creek it was then that they got the shock of their life two dead bodies sprawled out on the side of the path you see folks that's why you don't exercise it only leads to trouble <laughs> i was getting so into exercising what about the dead people my doctor was like you got to exercise and i was like okay 
And now it's been a week and a half because I had the flu last week and it was brutal. Like in bed, proper like can't get out of bed flu. And I was like, I'm feeling pretty good this week, but I was like, I'm not doing anything till Wednesday just in case it kicks it back off again. So tomorrow I begin exercising again. Hopefully I won't find any dead bodies by the river. That was, you know, don't exercise, folks. <laughs> the cyclist called the police who swarmed the scene. The victims were identified and two days later, the deaths were ruled as homicides. 42-year-old Jason Netta Sr. was the first victim. Jason was no saint, having had issues with the police in the past for drug-related activity. He also had long-standing family issues, particularly with his two daughters. It said that Jason had refused to pay child support to them or their mother, and the animosity had gotten so bad that one of his daughters had her last name changed so that she would no longer be associated with her father. Wow. You know you've been a dad where your when your kids are like no no i'm not getting married i'm just i'm just changing i just i just want to change my name i just don't like you you're a bell and i want to have a different name the second victim was 20 year old brianna foisy like jason brianna was a well had a well documented history of drug abuse it got to the point where her adoptive mother marcella foisy had staged an intervention in order to help her simply wanting her to get clean and get her life back on track but brianna would hear none of it and would end up homeless as a result what the two of them were doing there at that hour is unknown. Could it have been a drug deal? Could the two have been in the middle of some romantic get together? Well, we'll never know, sadly, because on that early morning, they weren't alone. Coming upon the two, the villain of our tale walked up to them, Colt Python in hand, and coldly gunned them down. No emotion, no hesitation. Looking through hours of surveillance footage from the area, the police released images of two men that they believed could be persons of interest, though it's unknown if either of these images captured the real killer unfortunately this wouldn't be the only two lives snuffed out by this brute as he would strike again 29 days later the boy on the bike on july the 29th 2016 shortly after 3 a.m the killer struck again this time in east anchorage and this time there were witnesses three girls were spending time together that night when they noticed something strange outside their window they spotted a tall figure lingering near Bolin station underneath the street lights unmoving looking in their direction before ducking into the woods if that doesn't sound like something right out of a horror film i don't know what does it does it's always all those things you're like ah that's creepy and then you're like yeah it's nothing it's nothing you know like when you're in your house and you're like you hear some rattling in the attic and you're like it's just the mice there's no one up there you can't get rid of the pepper dog except the one time there is and then you get murdered <laughs> soon after a young man was riding his bike to work just a day like any other he couldn't have known it but this would be his last day as he rode between Dubin Avenue and Bolin Street, the figure stepped out from the forest and mercilessly unloaded his gun into the young man. Hearing the gunshots, the girls looked out of the window again and saw the victim fall. The figure then walked over, grabbed the bike, and rode off on it. Police soon arrived and identified the body as that of 21-year-old Travion Kindle Thomas, a bright young man with a good future ahead of him, a life cut short for absolutely no reason at all. It was soon determined that the weapon that took the lives of Foisy and Netta was also the one that took the life of Thompson that night. And just a note here, remember the name of that victim in particular, they'll come up again later on. Okay, the name is Thompson. Noted. Under the direction of Sergeant Slavomir Markovitz, the three girls were questioned along with other witnesses, and they all gave the same description of what they saw. After all the interviews were complete and all the testimonies were taken into account, a description was noted and a composite scratch was created. A man over six feet tall with a pointed face, slightly sunken eyes and cheeks, shoulder-length brown hair, and vacant, eerie eyes wearing a camouflage jacket. Surveillance footage from the area confirmed the story, showing the killer advancing on Thompson, gun outstretched, and walking out of frame before riding off back into frame on the bike. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be long for the darkness over Anchorage to claim even more lives. Another double kill. Another month went by before more bodies were found. On the 28th of August 2016, at around 1.42 a.m., an unnamed woman was walking through Valley of the Moon Park, where she made a terrible discovery. The body of a young man was sprawled out on the trail, with several bullet wounds visible on his torso. The police were called, and searching the area, another body was found, closer by, under a pavilion in the park, riddled with bullet bullets. Very little evidence was left behind at the scene of the crime, and it wasn't long before medical reports confirmed that, you probably guessed it, it was the same Colt Python revolver that was involved in these murders as well. The beast's body count had risen to five. Yeah, that's the thing. It doesn't ma matter if you don't leave lots of evidence, but if you're using the same gun over and over again, that's all the evidence they need. You see one episode of CSI, you know they're matching those bullets up. They've got that device where they twist it round, and they look at the striations on the bullets, and they're like, guess where this came from? That same killer's gun. And then as soon as they catch you, which they'll eventually do because you're a 
very sloppy killer, they're going to tie you to all of these murders and then they're going to execute you. Because I feel maybe that's something they do in Alaska, right? That feels like something they'd do there, especially with all the criminals who apparently flee there. The body in the pavilion was identified as 34-year-old Kevin Turner. Turner had a history of mental illness, namely schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and had been homeless at the time as is not as had not fared well in assisted living facilities. The second boy on the trail was identified as non-binary 25-year-old environmental activist Brian DeHusson, known to their loved ones as Bree. Brian's father, Gordon, spoke with police after the discovery of his kid, and he proposed a theory, one the police agreed with. It's believed Bree had been on a late-night bike ride in their, on their new Schwinn bicycle on their way to meet a friend. On their way there, they unknowingly stumbled upon the vicious execution of Kevin Turner. Before Bree could react, the murderer spotted them, marched right up to the terrified person, and gunned them down as to not leave any witnesses. Given that no link had been identified between Turner and DeHusson, this seems highly likely. Wrong place, wrong time. And it cost a young person their life. Although, honestly, there doesn't seem to be a, a, there's not a connection between them, but there's not a connection between any of these other murders. They all just seem like horribly random. Like a guy's just wandering around just killing random people. Vulnerable people. Why? Why in science where it's like, there's probably not a why. They're probably just a psycho. <laughs> Now, with five bodies on their hands, the investigation kicked into overdrive. A serial killer was officially on the loose, and the citizens were in a panic. The police sent out a warning to the people of Anchorage to stay away from isolated locations after dark. Following the more recent deaths, the FBI finally got involved. They offered up a $10,000 reward for any usable information on the killer, receiving about three tips a day over the next two months. In the description of the incident, they focused mainly on the Thompson murder, as that's what gave witnesses the best look at the killer. They also didn't release information about the murder weapon for fear the killer could ditch the firearm in a bid to avoid detection. I get the feeling, in a way, that using the same gun over and over again in random killings, apparently which would could otherwise be seen as like unrelated, just seems to the point of, you are trying to get caught. On September the 6th, a press conference was held by the mayor of Anchorage, Ethan Berkowitz, to try and calm the populace, blaming the rising murder count on gang violence without mentioning the possibility of a serial killer. None of the victims, besides perhaps the first two, had any link to gangs. Things then went quiet for two months, until November the 12th. The End of Midnight Okay, so now we're all caught up and we're back to where we started, when the quiet early morning of November the 12th was shattered with an explosion of gunfire. The Colt Python 357 Magnum revolver erupted six times in a barrage of lead into Officer Salau, catching him in the gut. But Officer Salau, being a certified badass, managed to draw his weapon, exit his car, and return fire on the killer, even with his stomach gushing torrents of, torrents of blood. Wasn't he shot? He's shot six times in the stomach, and he still gets out of the car and returns fire. Legend. Things were looking bleak for Salau. He was losing a lot of blood fast. He attempted to grapple the killer and get his gun away from him, but the odds were against him, at least initially. He's been shot six times in the dummy! However, Officer Salau wasn't the- with a magnum! That's a big gun, right? However, Officer Salau wasn't the only one who'd answered the call over the radio. The second squad car came screeching up to the scene, with Sergeant Mark Patsky of the K-9 unit exiting his vehicle, gun in hand. Together with Salau, he opened fire on the murderer, riddling the camo-wearing killer with bullets. He was dead before he hit the ground. The reign of terror that had Anchorage in the grip of fear was finally over. Officer Salau was rushed to the hospital after the ordeal, losing consciousness soon after the killer fell. Salau, being a legend, survived six times. I made a video about what happens when you get shot, and it's like terrible. It's like worse. Than, you imagine being shot is like, yeah, it's bad. But it's like the ongoing medical complications, the fact that your insides got all kinds of messed up. If a bone was hit, if it was some sort of hollow point or bullet and all of this stuff, it's like, oh my God. It's a mess. And this guy got shot six times, and it's just like, boom, full recovery. Hero. The gun was taken from the scene and sent to the lab, where it was positively linked to all five murders. The killer was dead, and it was confirmed by the witnesses of the Thompson killing that they had their man. Finally, the cloak of mystery had been lifted, and we had a name to thank for all the bloody bedlam. James Dale Ritchie. So who was... James Dale Ritchie. 
James Del Ritchie was born in Anchorage, Alaska on November the 4th, 1976, making him 40 years old at the time of his death. He grew up in Anchorage and attended East Anchorage High School. A large man, six foot three, he was a star athlete, excelling at both football and as a defensive lineman and basketball, winning championships with both high school teams in 1994. During his downtime, he was known to hang out with his brothers, Bobby and Quincy Thomas, spending time with and growing close with their whole family during his teenage years. Now, just as an aside here, but remember when I said to remember that certain last name? Oh yeah, Thompson. Okay, so he's hanging out with these other guys called Thompson. Okie dokie. It's here that we come full circle as to why. Trevion Kindle Thompson, the third victim, was the son, the none other, of Bobby Thompson, Richard Richie's childhood friend. Wait, so he murdered his friend's from childhood son? On purpose? It's unknown if Richie had any idea who Trevion even was when he gunned him down in the street and took his bike. Nah, he just wanted to steal some kid's bike. That's all. And he murdered his old mate's kid. Man, that is f***ed up. Well, I mean, he's a murderer. What do we expect? Murdering is what he does. Indiscriminately, apparently. Bobby Thompson, who was in prison at the time, was devastated to learn that the nice young man who had grown up with had taken his son away. After only a single semester in college, Richie dropped out and returned home. The reason for this change isn't known, but once he got back, his life started going downhill. In 1995, he had gotten into the drug scene and was known to partake in dogfighting. It's also known that by 1998, Richie would at times go by the nickname Tiny, not in an ironic way from his large size, but because allegedly the man had a tiny penis. Tiny. Tiny. <laughs> Leave me alone. Okay. I like to think so. Richie had his first run-in with police in 1998 in relation to a drug investigation. When the officers came to question him at his door, he reportedly reached for his waistband, only for a handgun to fall out of his pants. Oh no. <laughs> it's like, oh, I dropped my illegal gun in front of the police. It reminds me of when I was at school. One of the most, it was just this bizarre scene. We must have been like 14 years old, and there was a kid in, in my year, and he's from Kazakhstan, this weird guy. It was like a boarding school, and so he you know, lived at school most of the year. And we were going to maths class and he's just trips and out of his pocket comes a box of cigars <laughs> and the cigars spill all over the floor in front of our maths teacher and it's just this surreal scene that this 14 year old kid's just rocking around with a box of cigars in his pocket <laughs> not even cigarettes you know like the normal vice of teenagers but like proper cigars and it's like that's bizarre and he was also this kid was also um he was the one who sold all the cigarettes and then he eventually got expelled because they went into his his room they like opened up his uh border's room and there were like thousands of cigarettes in there that he was just selling to everybody <laughs> that it all bring in from kazakhstan every year in a giant suitcase it's kind of like kind of kind of a, it's, you know respect that respect the hustle <laughs> Oh my god, this is bringing back so many memories. And I remember our biology teacher was like, he was doing that, you know that smoking demonstration where they get that smoking monkey and they show you how terrible smoking is for you? And he demonstrated the cigarettes from Kazakhstan, like the, the Kazakhstani Marlboros or whatever they were, and regular Marlboros with these two smoking monkeys and the ones from Kazakhstan, it was like, oh my, the regular Marlboros is like, oh my god, okay. And then the ones from Kazakhstan were like, oh. That's what, that's like what a miner's lung looks like. It was crazy. Thanks for that sidebar, Simon. Arresting him. Ah, oh, so the gun falls out on the floor in front of the police. Arresting him, they find a small electronic scale in his room, a stack of folded bills, and a baggie filled with several rocks of crack. In court, Richie pled no contest on all charges, being placed on probation for three years. In a letter to the judge, Richie stated, I lay in bed every night thinking about how I've ruined my life. Then I sit up crying, wishing I could go back to when I was in high school. I would have chosen a small Division II school to go play football at instead of a Division I college. I want to finish college, raise a family, and buy a house. In Instead, as a felon, I'll never be able to get a good job. It is crazy how, like, if you are a felon or whatever, and then, I, I, you know, I've applied for jobs in the past, and it's like, do you have a criminal record? And it's like, oh, I don't. So it's like, no. But can you imagine checking that box? Yes. That's going to be like, it's going to be so much harder to get a good job. And then it's like, doesn't that stay on there for, like, forever? Or a really long time? And that's going to really affect things. And what do you think it's going to do for, like, recidivism? It was like, yeah, I, I mean, and in a way, it's like, also, I want to know if someone's a criminal and they're working for me. <laughs> so, but you don't want people to, like, go back into crime. And if you take away their opportunities, where do you think they're going to go? 
Trouble only continued from there for Ritchie. While on probation in 1999, he was pulled over for driving erratically near Columbine Street and Debar Road. Telling officers he'd been drinking, his car was searched, and the officers found crack in the glove box and a loaded 45 caliber semi automatic handgun in the passenger seat. Once more, he pled no contest, and once more, he was given three years probation. <laughs> At least he knows what he wants to do. YouTube sometimes throws up these amazing recommendations, right? Yeah, it was like yesterday. I was just browsing through my homepage, seeing what's up, and there's just this clip from like uh police camera action whatever in australia and they pull it they pull this dude over because he's like i think he was swerving or whatever and they're like have you been having anything to drink tonight mate and he's like yeah yeah mate i had a, I had a beer a couple of beers maybe a, maybe a few more than a couple and then and then the officer's just like okay mate um anything else and he's like and the guys in the car is like yeah i got a long neck right long neck right here which apparently means like a bottle of liquor because like right next to him just jammed like in the passenger in the console between the two seats or whatever it's just like a full bottle of bourbon that he's drinking and the police officer is like all right mate well what we're gonna do is we're gonna need to make you have a breathalyzer test and he does it and he shows and they look at it in shock because he says 0.00 <laughs> and the guy's face is like what <laughs> Ah, it's amazing. And I also realized the viewer retention on that must be quite bad because I don't know how I didn't finish that video, but I don't know what happens in the end. I think I was in the middle of something. I must have got interrupted because I don't know how it ended, like whether they arrested him anyway because he was clearly drunk, even though it was like, no, mate, no alcohol in your blood. <laughs> Between 2002 and 2005, he was arrested several more times, mostly for drug-related offenses. Each time, he received a lesser sentence. However, all of that changed in 2005 when he was arrested for first-degree burglary. Apprehended while committing the act, he was found with two handguns, plastic handcuffs, eight zip ties, and $5,500 in his pocket. These... Uh, dude, how are you getting arrested with so many guns and so much drugs, and you haven't been sent to prison forever yet? Come on! This is America! Don't you have that thing where it's like, you do three small crimes and then you go to prison forever? This guy's got to be in that three small crimes thing. Let's go! <laughs> what he had plans for the occupants is unknown, though I think we can hazard a guess. He was finally sentenced to jail time for his crime, serving only two years. America, what's going on? You're like the country of famously harsh sentences. Let's go! It was upon leaving prison that Richie acquired the Colt Python handgun. How the hell the guy was able to get another gun after he'd already done, after what all that he'd done is beyond me. Well, probably the same way he got the first guns, illegally. Soon after, he gave the Colt Python to a friend for safekeeping before moving down to Broadway, Virginia, in order to be closer to his parents. For years after his release and relocation, Richie was a law-abiding citizen with only a handful of traffic violations to his name. However, after he reportedly broke up with his girlfriends, Richie moved back to Alaska in March 2016, re retrieving his gun once he did so. Mate, nothing good happens for you in Alaska. Don't go back. Stay in Virginia. Come on. He resided in the neighborhood of Airport Heights for a time before moving to Pendham Parkway Trailer Park in Anchorage. Then something happened, perhaps a sign that Richie realized something was wrong with his mind. He sought out mental health treatment. The police looked into it after his death, but it's unknown if he received any kind of help that he sought, and soon after is when he went on a rampage that terrified the citizens of Anchorage for the entire summer of 2016. Looking at the spree killings, it almost appears that Richie didn't care that about getting caught, at least at first. Yeah, he's using the same gun over and over again. Hell, upon stealing Trevon Kindle Thomas's bike, he brought it to his house, where it was openly displayed and witnessed by many, though it was never linked to the murder until after he was identified. That's pretty ballsy, though. <laughs> Speaking of Thompson, his mother, Mandy Primo, was on the warpath after his death. She conducted an independent investigation, searching desperately for the identity of the person who stole her son away from her. She even at one point managed to identify Richie, by, uh, armed with his Colt Python near the Anchorage Regional Hospital in October 2016, a full month before the showdown with Officer Salau. She reported it to the police, claiming she intended to confront the man herself, but was advised for the sake of her own well-being, as well as that of the investigation, to not do anything. And the rest, as they say, is history. Cold in the Street Why? 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 It's the prevailing question we must all ask when it comes to cases such as this. Whether it be in relation to serial killers or a single quest killing, the question of why 
plagues us all. Unfortunately, this is one case where that answer will elude us forever. The one chance we had of uncovering that answer died on that sidewalk in the early no- early morning of November 2016, lying sprawled out in an ever-growing pool of his own blood, multiple bullet holes riddling his body. James Dale Ritchie, the Midnight Sun killer, was a demented man and a vicious murderer, with a motive that is an enigma to everyone involved, whether it be the police, his family, or the family and friends of those he gunned down in cold blood. Murders and other crimes in Alaska are ever prevalent, but this spree of death will continue to live on for its sheer ferocity and arguably complete randomness. Yeah, it just seems like something something broke in his mind. Penis. You should see his penis. He was on a bad path in life anyway. He had been in a lot of trouble with all the drugs in the prison and all of this stuff. And then it just seems he escalated and just kind of lost it. People do. They don't, they just without any particular motivation, just just lost it. The ironic part is, as random as the attacks that Richie perpetrated were, his demise was just as random. Had he not stiffed the cab driver, he never would have called the police. Had the driver never called the police, Richie would have never been confronted by Officer Salau on the streets, and the firefight would have never taken place. Richie was a phantom. He wasn't even near the top of the suspect list. Had he not made that one careless mistake, a seemingly thoughtless act, he could still have gone under the radar of the police. He could still have continued his rampage of death and bloodshed. It's chilling to think about, but it's also a grim reality that we thankfully don't have to live in. As Anchorage Police Lieutenant John McKinnon said to Alaska Dispatch News, Mr. Ritchie, we just came upon by happenstance. As of now, no other murders have been linked to James Dale Ritchie, although that hasn't stopped police from searching. His life is being gone through with a fine tooth comb by police in Alaska and in Virginia, seeing if his whereabouts and movements coincide with any other killings. One incident caught the eyes of investigators, that being a double homicide on January 28, 2016. 19-year-old Selena Annette Mullinax was found by a dog walker at an overlook called Point Warren's Off, and 20-year-old Foragen Hubert Morissette was found close by passing away on the way to the hospital. Both these deaths remain unsolved to this day. While they seemed to fit Richie's MO, he was reported to have not come back to Alaska until March of that year, nor were they shot with his gun, as he didn't have it on him at the time, leaving his involvement in the deaths of these two young people rather unlikely. Yeah, okay, so two people were murdered, but in that's all. <laughs> and he was a murderer. There's He used the same gun all the time. He wasn't there. This is completely unrelated, and people drawing that that conclusion are like, just go find the real killers. Come on, don't stop, stop doing this. Go find the real killers. For now, we look back on the victims of this horrible monster. It's their lives that mattered in this situation, and it's them who should be mourned, not the beast that ended everything for them all. Jason Netta Senior, Brianna Foisy, Trevon Kindle Thompson, Kevin Turner, Brian Hassan. These five unfortunate souls were lost to the world for no reason other than the deranged machinations of an evil man with a gun. It is them who deserve to be remembered, but as the world works, it's the name of the killer that's etched into the history books. A shame. May James Dale Ritchie rot in whatever pit the devil wishes to throw him, and maybe the five victims of the soulless monster rest easy, knowing that the brute that took everything from them can no longer take from anyone else. And that's where we end today's episode. Nice little short one today. <laughs> nice, Simon, what's wrong with you? short one today if you enjoyed this episode if you enjoyed this show please do consider leaving it a review on apple podcasts or wherever you get your episodes and thank you for watching or listening 